Welcome to episode two of the Soothsight podcast. My guest today is Dr. Anthony Scriffignano. He holds a bachelor's and master's in computer science from Montclair State, an MBA from Columbia, and a PhD in leadership and change from Antioch. He is a globally acclaimed data scientist with 45 years of experience spanning numerous industries and continents. He has held a variety of leadership positions at prestigious companies such as Deloitte, taught graduate level courses at Seton Hall, and after 21 years, just retired from his role as chief data scientist at Dun & Bradstreet. He's currently in shadow mode, but getting ready to announce his next big adventure. In addition, Anthony has over 100 publications, nearly the same number of patents, numerous awards, including Chief Data Officer of the Year, and is a commissioner for the Atlantic Council. He's advised a plethora of world leaders and contributed to more publications than I even knew existed, a few of which include CIO, Forbes, The Hill, and Business Insider. He's also an EMT, speaks six languages, and is a member of Mensa. Suffice it to say, he is a literal genius and one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. Anthony, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much. I, when that guy you're talking about gets here, boy, I can't wait. Um, <laughs> forgotten nerd, but that's okay, or propeller head, something like that. There you go, there you go. Um, it's, it's great to be here with you and to get a chance to talk a little bit. I, you know, anytime we, we talk, there's always a, healthy smattering of technology and philosophy and epistemology and all that. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Likewise. So there's a, an old joke along the lines of old age is statistically good for you. Very few people die past 100. So in the age of big data, how do you make sure that you are factoring the right assumptions about data so that you do not come to the wrong conclusions? Well, you know, it's a good question, and there's no perfect answer to that. These terms that we use, right and wrong, are to some extent subjective. It depends very much on the question, depends very much on the context. What I like to stress in my career as a data scientist is the science part of data science, the empirical rigor. So what do I have to believe in order to believe your conclusion? Why? Is the method that you use the right method? What are some of the sources of bias in your answer? This right wrong thing, if you wanna, if you wanna measure things like alpha in the stock market, or if you wanna measure, um, you know, whether or not a certain percentage of students improve and so forth, maybe maybe you'll be able to get to right and wrong in terms of methodology. But this there's many more cases where. Those shades of gray will get you. And the older you get, it's ironic that we turn gray as we get older. The older you get, the more you appreciate the shades of gray. When we're younger and just starting out in our careers, especially in data science, everything looks like a machine learning problem. Everything looks like it has an answer. You know, think about how you felt when you when you first got introduced to calculus. What do you mean I can get as close to the answer as I want, but there's no exact answer? That's kind of mind blowing. And a lot of problems are like that. So very long way of saying empirical rigor is a big part of it. Uh, being able to explain what you did so that other people could reach the same conclusion, given the same data and the same methods, being very clear about your bias and being very honest about the shortcomings of whatever methodology you use. So everywhere we look, there are scores for things like carbon and supplier ratings and, and happiness indices. How do we measure things that are not metric, not empirical? For instance, I think I heard you say before, you know, how many ducks are in the pond that you can measure, right? But if you want to say, are those ducks swimming frantically? It's a, a matter of opinion. So how do you do something like that? In other words, how do you quantify the accuracy of a source and create some sort of reliability score where each source is evaluated based on the quality of information being provided? So there's a lot in that question. <laughs> a lot of times when you see accuracy, when you see that term, what it means is we back tested this, this method, whatever it is, on some data from the past. And we, these are sometimes called supervised methods. We, we took a certain big chunk of the data and we did a bunch of regression, a bunch of math on it. And we, we built a, a method or an equation that predicts 
that data. And then we tested it on the remaining part of the data and a certain percent of the time it was the same or within certain limits and we call that accuracy. And generally speaking, if you have a future that is reasonably unperturbed and looks reasonably like that longitudinal pass on which you trained yourself, then you're good to go. Raise your hand if you think that our future is relatively unperturbed and looks reasonably like our past. It, it just doesn't, especially lately. But now with regard to certain things, you know, you're looking at weather patterns, geology, global warming, you know, it, you might have enough data that you can do things like that. I'm not saying that it's never a good idea to do that. But in many of the places where you see this term accuracy used, it's it's kind of misused mathematically. It's dangerous to assume that something that was a certain percentage accurate in the past will be the same percentage accurate going forward. So I gave you that example of the ducks on the pond as a, it's an easy visual. Like anybody can say, well, we're going to count how many ducks and all right, maybe, you know, is that a goose or a duck? Like I, it, we might argue about whether the duckishness of something on the pond, but in general, we can get to a point where we can all agree on how many ducks there are on the pond. But now if you say, you know, do they seem to be swimming frantically? My definition of frantically and your definition of frantically might be different. Probably are. And a lot of times what gets applied in the law and in, in arguments is this something called the reasonable person standard. Like a, a reasonable person would agree that if you see fluttering, it's frantic. Well, I don't know. You know, it, so you can start to say, well, what are some, what are some of the characteristics that are common to the reasonable person standard that you would apply to that attribution that you want to give it. Another way to do it is to get a bunch of people and have them look at the same information and form their own subjective opinion and then look at the commonality of those opinions. That's what they do in the Olympics when they give scores. You get a bunch of judges and there's there's a great, you know, there's certainly a technical aspect to it. You either did or didn't do certain critical things, but then there's also judgment. That's why they're called judges. And the reason they don't have only one is because there is variation in the way humans perceive things. And so you, there's lots of mathematical techniques. You can throw out the high and the low score. You can look for optimism and pessimism. You can, um, this is something called heuristic rigor, where, you know, like how close do you approach the behavior of reasonable people with the same instruction and the same background? There's, there's all kinds of methodological treatments for getting at something that is consistent, but you have to be very careful about calling that anything mathematical, about accuracy. So score generally means something very specific. It's in mathematically, it's continuous, differentiable. You can you can do math on it. There's you understand the relationship. A lot of times you see ratings or rankings to get around that problem. Like we don't have the math to say it's a, it, you know, it, the, the ranking is from one to 10. It doesn't mean that that nine is 12 and a half percent better than eight. It just means nine's better. All the nines are better than all the eights, right? Rankings are, are helpful. Uh, certainly we, we, we have grade A eggs and grade AA eggs. And you know, that, that works pretty well when you're buying eggs. I don't even know why. I, I never really understood why you'd buy a lower grade egg, but I suppose there's baking. Yeah. Um, but that's a good example where, you know, you can look at something and say, you know, I always joke, who wants the pretty good anesthesia, right? Nobody. But um, there might be times where it's important to rank these things. We can get the pretty good anesthesia really fast and the really good anesthesia is going to take a month. Uh, your baby is due tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, so, you know, rank rankings and, and, and stratification indices, things like that are very helpful. For, for making quick decisions and consistent decisions, but you have to be very careful when you start imputing math on them, because very often there's a lot of subjectivity built into that. And, you know, go forward carefully. The, the standard, same answer as I gave you before, empirical rigor. If you did it again, would you get the same ranking, right? And if, if you did, then it's probably a good method. If you do it five times and get five different answers, maybe you might want to think about that. Excellent point. So 
obviously it's all the buzz, but ChatGPT raises some some interesting questions regarding data quality and veracity. So if I tell ChatGPT to write me a description for a business that sells paper stationery, there's seemingly no right or wrong answer, whereas some of the things that you've worked on require very specific answers, you know, addresses, previous and current owners, likelihood that a business has multiple locations, how far are those locations from each other? So how do you contrast problems that need very specific solutions versus these kinds of creative aids? Well, you know, we're, we're sitting on the cusp of, um, you know, GPT-4, you know, um, remember how the world felt when AlphaGo came along. Oh my gosh, a computer bit, beat the best human at Go and, and, and therefore computers are smarter than people. Well, no, computers are better at playing Go than people. And if we want to be specific, that particular computer is better at, you know, so it's not like hopeless for mankind, right? There, there's always going to be um, evolution. These large language models are getting a lot of attention lately. And I, I don't want to name one in particular because then by definition, you're not naming the others. That's not fair. Uh, but uh, they ingest very large corpora of language. I know you know a lot about this and, and they try to mimic a certain behavior, whether it's summarization or actually articulation, you know, writing an article or, or somebody sent me an interview that I didn't do um, that they produced, you know, by looking at enough of the stuff that's out there with people talking to me because I talk too much, right? Um, too many words. Uh, if you produce a lot of words, then some algorithm is going to ingest those words and sooner or later get pretty good. And when I read it, I was like, eh, I wouldn't really say that, but I could see how it sounds like me saying it, right? Um, there's lots of really good reasons why these sorts of things can be very helpful. Imagine you're in a field where you are just simply overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that you have to read in the time that you have to read it. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to push a button and get a summary? Well, it would, but be careful what you wish for because you're going to miss tone and nuance. You're going to inherit whatever bias is in that algorithm. But if you said, well, the counter argument is I don't have time. So it's either don't do it at all or do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that, right? Um, could malefactors use this technology to do really sophisticated deep fakes? You betcha. Um, could they use this sort of technology? Um, could it be used to cheat in school? You betcha, probably already is. In fact, I kind of know it is. Um, you know, as, as a former um, academic, um, ask different questions that aren't so easily summarized, right? What If I ask you, um, I think that one of these, I won't name the one, but one of these uh, approaches just got a, a five on the AP in history, right? But that's history. That's stuff that happened in the past. If I ask you to opine on what you think are the implications of a dystopian future society in the context of, you know, uh, large language models, yeah, maybe enough people have said stuff about that, that you could get a little bit of a fake on it. But I'm asking you what you think and kind of hard for you to, you know, search that in a search engine. Um, the other, there's a, a number of fallacies with these models, and you and I might disagree a little bit on this. Um, you know, you, you ingest enough language uh, that you can start to mimic the way that language was spoken, but language evolves. And, you know, we, we recently had a president whose last name was a verb, right? President Trump, right? So when um, you go from being a verb to being a proper noun, you know, that language changes with an election and uh, the language, every example of that word is is a different part of speech, right? Those are kind of party tricks to point out examples like that. But there's enough cases where the, the usage of language is is nuanced and the more language from the past you consume, the more you miss out on that nuance. Could it introduce racial bias? Could it introduce um, fighting words, you know, anger? Um, could it introduce um, the opposite of the meaning of uh, sort of like these antithetical things where, you know, I meant to say this, but you interpret it, you, you betcha all the time. So I think there's a lot of good in that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I think that there's also, a, a, we haven't figured out how all of this works just yet, and we're rushing the market with all of it. And 
you know, lots of big platforms are starting to say, well, we'll help you write your emails. We'll help you, you know, summarize your meetings. And all that. Okay. Um, but, you know, you notice the tone of voice in which I said that. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that it might make certain things better, but we better pay attention. So when you get back to the question you asked about the, you know, the things in life that are lots of, um, it's what's called heterogeneity, right? There's lots of data that describes, uh, you mentioned like where a business is, right? Well, everybody's working from home. Where is that business? Uh, is it where the business says it is or where people are at home? That's not in the data. That's in the way you ask that question. So we have to get better at asking questions, knowing that the sort of technology is going to be used to produce some of the answers. And I think we might need some either generally accepted practices or possibly even, dare I say, regulation that requires that when I'm reading something that was written by a machine, that it tells me that there's a byline. That this was not written by Christopher Dole. This was written by an algorithm playing the role of Christopher Dole, right? And it's Dole-esque, but not Dole. Okay? Probably be a little smarter. It just occurred to me that your name is a verb as well. It's interesting. Yeah, on the Dole. Yeah. Yeah.